Welcome back to another edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, and today I am honored and uh, actually astounded that we have our very first sitting member of Parliament for 2022 sitting down with us in the first month of uh, the year, uh, the Calgary Forest Lawn MP, and I want to get this right here, the Shadow Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, Jazz Raj Holland. Thank you so much, Jazz, for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Chris, thanks so much for having me. I'm really honored to be on this podcast with you. So uh, anyone who's listened to the show before knows any uh, uh, conversation I have with politicians or candidates to become politicians starts off the exact same way. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Thank you for the question. Uh, it, you know, it, for me, it, it, it's a lifelong thing. Uh, I grew up, I, I guess, around I was very fortunate to grow up around a lot of uh, blessed people in my life that always put service in front of themselves. Um, as a kid, I was always raised within our Gurdwara or our, you know, Sikh temple, where I would be around a lot of seniors. And what I saw within the seniors was that no matter what kind of a day you were having or whatever situation you were in, number one priority was to make sure that people around you were okay and that we lived up to this one concept within, you know, the Sikh religion, which is seva, selfless service. And I've just been very fortunate in my life to be around a lot of people, not just in the Sikh faith, but the community at large. You know, I consider myself uh, a product of this Canadian community that helped to raise me with many, many wonderful individuals. But I really got to say that it's the seniors that I've been around that showed me just what selfless service really was. Um, to put your own, um, you know, hardships aside to help others. And I've been around other individuals such as, you know, the late Manmeet Singh Puller, who was an uh, exemplary human being who left us early um, from his life, uh, helping someone out of a ditch. He was uh, sitting in MLA and, um, you know, he was a minister of the crown here. And, you know, he, from uh, a young age, I used to see him just do nothing but selfless service. So what I can attribute to service is honestly just the, the blessings I've had with the people I've grown up with. This community, Canadian community has blessed me and my family with so much, and it's only upon us. It's, it's a duty of ours to make sure that we're giving back. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot of service, even just playing sports growing up. You wouldn't believe it by looking at the size of my belly now, but I played a lot of sports growing up. And what you also learn from that is how to work within a team. And, and you kind of stay in your lane and, and know your role because you play a bigger role and politics is the same thing. You, you wanna, you're contributing to a, a bigger team and to a bigger goal of yours. And it does take a lot of uh, selfless service sometimes to understand that and that you're, whether it's a small role or a big role you're given, it all plays a part in this overall goal that we have, which is to help make Canada better and the lives of Canadians better. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. Um, so before we get into the uh, conversation about the pressing issues of the day, I want to have uh, one question pointed at you, and this was not prepared, and I, I've, I've never had the pleasure to ask this question to uh, a member of parliament before. You were one of the few people in Canadian history to set foot in the House of Commons. You were there to make lives for Canadians easier. How much of a daunting task is that for you to be in the halls of power and make changes that affects Canadians from coast to coast to coast? Well, Chris, uh, <laughs> I want to really hit the, the heartstrings on that question. Um, you know what? I, I, I cannot tell you how great of an honor it is to be one of 338 people in this blessed country to be able to step in the House of Commons and represent the amazing people of Calgary Forest Lawn. Um, I moved here um, with my family as an immigrant and just seeing the hardships my family faced and many others around us. We moved to this amazing riding when we first moved to Canada. And, um, you know, I stood in the line 
with my with my family for low income bus passes inside of this this rising this riding and living through the the hardships that we did i didn't come from a political background or a political family whatsoever um and just to, even my mom to this day she doesn't care whether i'm an mp or not what i am she just says you have to be a good human being first um but it is an absolute honor every single time you step foot into the house of commons it's that overwhelming feeling and this huge responsibility that you don't take lightly that people have entrusted you to be their voice in ottawa and to make sure that they're not only just heard but we speak up for them sometimes it's a very difficult um that you have to take a position that might be not the same as your parties or what's what's the general public what they want but you know those are the that's the responsibility you've been blessed with so all i can say is it's a huge blessing and you know i i i pray that every single day that that feeling doesn't go away because i think once that feeling goes away of of actually feeling like you're blessed or you know you, you're honored to step in that house of commons then i think that's the point you know that you know i i i've i've done all i can do and and that if that feeling is gone then it's probably not uh the time for me to continue doing this we we are a few weeks away till the return of parliament in february of 2022 what is your focus what is going to be your focus and what is the biggest things that you need to be advocating for because you are a conservative member of parliament you have a liberal government across the aisle from you so what are you advocating for for the people of calgary forest lawn but also canadians in as a whole uh absolutely this is such an important question especially today at a time when um we all know about the inflation rate it's out of control uh housing is unaffordable these days for anyone not just newcomers that are coming here i also have the responsibility of being the shadow minister for immigration refugees and citizenships these are some of the most pressing issues today we also have um other issues such as we we know that there's a, a labor crisis in this country and we know that immigration plays a huge role in that um so i i'll kind of break it down for you uh chris so when it comes to immigration we're dealing with a, a a plethora of issues and one of the main issues that i've been bringing up since i was elected in 2019 is is backlogs uh backlogs are what are are driving our economy down uh though like i was talking about the labor crisis in this country it would help address those and many other issues we we hear all these heartbreaking stories about families who are not able to reunite that are being separated and they stay separated you know I, as a father of of two beautiful little daughters i can't even imagine what people go through when they when they have to miss their kids for steps their birthdays or other milestones just because of the immigration backlog which is a literally a, a liberal made immigration backlog because we've never seen 1.8 million applications in backlog before which is which is astounding and so it is upon us that we i need to keep and our party has been pushing the liberal government that you know we've been proposing solutions the whole way we just hope it it, it we can see some progress on that so employers can find uh, uh you know people that can work uh and you know families can reunite but more importantly everyone loves canada <clears throat> I I was blessed enough to see the Canadian dream as a parliamentarian I would love to see others come here and realize that Canadian dream but along with that Canadian dream we came at a time when you know it was possible to you could lose a little and still find other avenues to make money and you know your your the money that you had in your account was was something that would would be uh you know like because of inflation right now your 100 dollars is not 100 dollars in your account anymore the cost of goods is out of control right now and it's because we keep piling debt in this country we need to have better um management we need to make sure we get that debt under control not just for the people that are living here but for people that want to see that canadian dream those newcomers that are coming here we need to give them a chance there's a very very concerning number last year that came out that 50% of refugees live in poverty and you know that's a very concerning to someone like me because i've i've seen that that side of life and i wouldn't want anyone else to go through those hardships because with the rising cost of everything and you know housing is is a, is a crisis on its own all these factors together are harming 
not just Canadians, but new Canadians and newcomers that are coming to this country. So we have a lot of different issues that are going on. We all know that COVID is still going on. It's been two years. And for our party, we're trying to push for more solutions to be able to make sure that we're going back to that normal that everyone wants to see. So those are some of the, the main issues. And these are issues that are core here in uh, Calgary Forest Lawn. Now, I'll just give you a, a quick example. I was, I was a home builder in my previous life. And um, in 2008, when the Conservatives were in power, we saw what was like a Great Depression here. Uh, you know, it was, it was very concerning. Things had crashed. The markets had crashed. But as a home builder and, and you know, as a small business owner, by 2009, I had seen a lot of recovery already happen. I, I, you could see it by the amount of houses that were back on sale. The, just the supply was, uh, you know, reducing in, in homes just because of that. A lot of people were opening new businesses because that's how much business there was to have back then. There was a difference back then and to what we've seen in 2015. So in 2015, um, and, and actually close to the end of 2014, we saw the same type of decline in, in uh, our business. And when I still talk to people in the home building industry, tradespeople, they don't feel like they've ever really recovered from 2015. And, you know, there was a big difference between when there was a conservative government and a liberal government, because during the conservatives time, uh, you know, Prime Minister Stephen Harper had taken a very Team Canada approach at that time. Um, they had created this uh, national works program, and it was a lot of dealing with the opposition and making sure we were taking ideas from all the opposition, putting things together to make sure that we're helping the recovery as soon as possible. The difference now that I'm seeing, even as a new parliamentarian, is that, you know, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has not only not wanting to listen to any um, advice from uh, experts or even from uh, oppositions. He's even not listening to people in his own party. And that is very concerning because our debt keeps going up. And we all know uh, this is the same prime minister that said budgets would balance themselves. And he doesn't think about monetary policy at all. Um, you know, we have to think about Canadians first. We have to put the interest of Canadians first. That is what we've been proposing. We still need to take this Team Canada approach, and that is what we'll continue to do. But just as a small example, that's what we've been seeing. You know, small businesses are the backbone of not just the economy, but they are the backbone of a lot of communities, especially ethnic communities. And in my own experience, I've seen the most charity being done through small businesses. So I think it is our duty to make sure that we're continuing to support small businesses especially the ones here in Calgary Forest Salon. We have such amazing entrepreneurs that are newcomers to this country who want to take that risk and contribute to Canada. And we need to make sure that we're, we have the right framework in this country so that they can succeed because immigrant success is Canada's success and Canadian success is Canada's success. So that's what we need to put out in front when we're not just legislating, but when we're forming new policy. I want to I want to just go back to a comment that you made earlier on, and that is 1.8 million backlog of immigration files. Now, uh, I, I'm just going to push back here, and these this is the way that I work, and I just want to see what you say. Many would say that's because of COVID-19. COVID-19 has changed the name of the game when it comes to immigration. What are you doing with your counterpart across the aisle, Sean Frazier, the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, to ensure that that 1.8 million backlog starts to get going here in 2022? Because that's the main issue is there are families right now who, like you said, are dispersed, whether they be back in their country and they're trying to come to Canada to reconnect with their families. How do we change a backlog of 1.8 million? Because you know how well bureaucracy runs. It runs very slowly sometimes. And right now with COVID, it is running at a snail's pace. So how do we change the name of getting those families reconnected in 2022? Great question. I, I really like the, the feedback that you're giving. Um, look, th the real issue here is priority. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the the reason why it's 1.8 million is because there is no, no real priority being set. There's no precedence on trying to tackle this number down. The prime minister has come out and wants to have 400,000 plus 
you know, PRs come, you know, either be finalized here or come from abroad. <clears throat> what we're missing in that is the fact that there's no real priority to that. This is just a number and we're just increasing the load on immigration itself. This is not to say that we don't need 400,000 people. I'm in support of the number because I know as well as many others know that that would help our economy, that would help this housing crisis, the labor crisis. And on top of that, we need new blood, new, new, new thoughts, new ideas into this country. What we're not seeing is better infrastructure to help tackle that issue. So since I was elected, I've been putting many, many different, um, different uh, you know, solutions to this, such as we need a better triage system like we see inside hospitals. We need to make sure that the, the applications that are coming in are going to the right places, that they're you know, the, the ones that can be done at a quicker pace. We need to get those and file those through. Given that all the checks and balances are in place, which we have a great checks and balance system in this country. We need to make sure that we are, um, you know, like I said, you know, the prime ministers had laid out 400,000 new people. This was more, in, a, in our eyes, it's more of a, an election ploy that, look, we're bringing in the most people, but we're not really bringing everyone in here. Those are just approved, but there's so many small issues along the way. PR cards are not being issued in time, which is holding back uh, families from putting their kids in school from uh, people getting jobs, people getting mortgages. So these are some of the, the core issues. It's the backlog that keeps getting created. Now, when we talk about COVID, we have to think about it like this. It's been two years since this pandemic started. We should already have a better way to handle all this pressure that we've had, whether it's, and these are pr propositions that we've put forward and had passed in some of our committees, we should move everything online. Uh, you know, I give the example all the time that our immigration system should look like something like Amazon, where everything is online. People should know with transparency and clarity where their application is at, how long it's really going to take, and it would help reduce the fees. We've heard through our own MP offices like horrific stories where one box has not been checked off, IRCC sends back an application. It doesn't even go back to that applicant. They've sent it to the wrong address. And we're talking about people here who are working so hard to get their PR and they work day and night. Some of these, these incredible people that want to make Canada home and, you know, their application gets sent by mistake to another house, which increases the stress the the, the application gets delayed. We need to have a lot more transparency. So we've been putting forward uh, solutions such as moving everything online. Also, our interviews should be online. There should be no reason in 2022 where we cannot, um, you know, modernize our system now, where we don't need to worry about whether there's a spike in COVID or not, because we have a system set out. It's been two years. We should be able to fix this stuff now. And the backlog issue, again, uh, I'll take it back that we we didn't, we, we didn't need to um, low, overload our system. Uh, we've heard from the liberals over and over again, well, we've thrown this many million dollars at the problem. We've thrown this, but we don't see any solutions coming out of that. We've been asking, what's the plan? And I'll continue to keep pushing. What's the plan to lower that number down so that people can make Canada home and they can contribute to Canada and live the Canadian dream? Uh, we also did not need this very selfish election in 2021 that was the most expensive cabinet shuffle in Canada's history. We could have been doing a lot more than just taking Canadians and, and within a strong fourth wave. And as, as Kabul fell in Afghanistan, abandoning those that served Canada, we should have been focused on Canadians and made sure that we were helping not just in immigration, but other, other aspects. So that, that's, that's what I would say to that. You you must be you must be well versed at doing interviews because you are the perfect segue artist here because I was about to talk about Afghanistan and those interpreters because of those 1.8 million we're not even talking about the interpreters who helped Canadians in Afghanistan over the last numerous years and they are being stuck in limbo since almost election day or election call uh, August 10th or 11th whatever day it was. Does the liberals and the does the liberals and Sean Frazier at this point have to wear this as a badge of shame that we have people who helped Canada who are stuck in a war torn country right now because we are not 
moving at a pace that we said we would before the election. Absolutely, Chris. Look, um, people being abandoned and stuck in Afghanistan um, was happening way prior to the election that happened last year. In 2015, uh, through the amazing work of Manmeet Singh Puller, the World Sikh Organization, and later on by the Manmeet Singh Puller Foundation, I was uh, fortunate enough to sponsor uh, a very persecuted a refugee family from Afghanistan. It had taken the liberal government four years to get those families here. And within four years, we were hearing horrific stories where young uh, persecuted women of different backgrounds, whether it was Hazara community, Hindus, Sikhs, they were being uh, you know, abducted while they were walking to school. There was forced marriages, forced conversions. There was all sorts of all these bad things happening to those those people that were being persecuted in Afghanistan, it still took the liberal government almost four years to get people here, which is totally unacceptable when all the sponsorships were ready to go. These were private sponsorships. Everything was set in place. The money was all in order, but it still took them until then. And 2019 was an election year, remember? So, you know, a lot of people were raising questions that was this just, were they used as, as an election ploy at the time? Now, there are still families since then are, that are still waiting to come here. And these applications have been in for four to five years. So it's not like this is a new problem because this problem has been before. And again, it's not like we haven't seen this program being used before. This is, uh, we have the, the rainbow program that we're, where we can bring people over to Canada under the refugees. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all about priority again. And that's what we keep seeing failure over and over again now. With the Af Afghan in interpreters, um, we were pushing even before the election. I, I had uh, met with groups of Afghan interpreters even before the election was called. And was I wrote a letter to the immigration minister about that. And this is, this is not a partisan issue whatsoever because um, two years prior to that uh, and one year prior to that, there was a multi-party letter written to, uh, at the time, um, Minister of Immigration Marco Mendicino that we need to clear up those applications of the people that are stuck in Afghanistan. And there was no action taken. And obviously there was, there was nothing done about it. And those people, uh, and we all know when Kabul fell, it, it fell and people were stranded there. Now, those interpreters are, uh, were telling us even before the election, look, Kabul is falling. We need to get our family members out. And, you know, I had written a letter to the, the minister at the time. And again, there was, there was no... Uh, sense of urgency, there was no action taken. And then the election was called, which we all know was 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 almost like a cover up to the failures that happened there. And those interpreters still, I have interpreters that come to, into our office here and they, you know, come one day and they say, you know, we, we need help getting out. Um, they keep having this, um, the same uh, result as far as emailing the email that they've been given uh, an auto generated reply without any further communication after that. And some of them are in there for months. And then a few days later, they say, look, uh, we, we have to cancel the application. Uh, you know, the Taliban found whoever it was and, uh, and, you know, they killed them during uh, an adversary. Shortly, sh shortly after the election, um, there was a data leak that was from IRCC to the Taliban that, we already knew that there was a bunch of leaks through the embassy where the Taliban had gotten a hold of almost a lot of a lot of the people that served and their families' information. And so they were already under threat. But then there was a data leak that happened where there's information that was ac accidentally sent to the Taliban. Uh, I called for a probe into that to make sure that um, we find out that it, what happened and so that it doesn't happen again. Now, recently, uh, a few weeks back, our party called for a new um, a new committee to be formed, the Afghan committee, to find out not just what exactly happened when the election was being called in a selfish way and we abandoned all those people, but there was kind of exposed two things in my eyes. It exposed that immigration cannot handle a crisis today's date and process other applications at the same time. During the election, all MPs' offices, even though they were run by staff, they were shut out from doing any inquiries besides what was happening in Afghanistan. Now, that's concerning to me because those same people that were trying to 
get here and emailing about Afghanistan were left on read or auto reply. And I've been asking that in the, in the House of Commons as well. But it shows that we cannot handle a crisis situation here in Canada. Immigration needs to be put up, back up into, uh, to, be, to be in par. We also <clears throat> are, are trying to make sure the second thing, the reason why it was called that this new committee was formed was to make sure that this doesn't happen again that we don't abandon those that serve Canada. Canada still needs to serve those that serve Canada. And this Liberal government failed to in Afghanistan when Kabul fell. So I'm really glad I'm actually a member on that committee as well. We should be starting up uh, either at the end of this month or starting of next month, just to get those answers and hear those stories of the people that were um, abandoned and, and actually appreciate the NGOs and the veterans that stepped up when the Canadian government didn't to support those people that served Canada. So I'm really looking forward to getting into the work into that committee and the immigration committee. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite. Be sure to hit that subscribe button today to be kept in the loop of all the great episodes that are coming up on the show. Also, click on the links in the show notes and follow our social media pages as well. I'm just conscious of time here. And I feel like we could talk about immigration probably for another 45 minutes to an hour if we had Absolutely. to. Um, but I want to talk about inflation because inflation is one of, if not the biggest thing that is going to face Canadians in 2022. And I say that knowing that we have the rise of Omicron, we have COVID-19, we're not sure when that's going to be done, but inflation is going to affect every Canadian. As much as uh, we don't want COVID to, inflation will. We are living in a time where cost of living is going through the roof. House prices are going through the roof. I recently went to the grocery store, I think last weekend, and I an average grocery bill for our family was about $350. This time it was about $600. And we went, oh God, we have to cut back on some things. How do we fix this? Uh, we, we are living in a divided country right now, and the liberals are in government. The opposition can say they can bang their desk, scream at the top of their lungs, but at the end of the day, the liberals will have to figure this out for themselves. Is there anything that the conservatives and yourself can do to try to sway the liberals to try and make this an important issue? Because it doesn't seem like it is to them. And that's just me being an outsider and for full transparency here full transparency, anyone who's listened to the show knows this, I ran for the Liberals. I'm pissed off at the Liberals. I hate the Liberals right now with what I'm do they're doing to my pocketbook as a small business owner. How can we fix this? Uh, great, man. And, and <laughs> I, I didn't know that you ran for the Liberals, but, you know, congratulations for putting your name forward. You you know more than anyone, it's, it's not easy. So I, I applaud you for putting your name forward. Look, you said it right. Canada has never been as divided as it has been under this Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau where we're seeing certain regions of the country being pitted against others, certain industries being pitted against others. And more and more as we are in this pandemic, we see groups of people being pitted against other groups of people. A prime minister's job is to unite, unite Canadians, unite people together. We have never seen this much divide ever. In the years that I've lived in this beautiful country, I've never seen people so divided Me and being pitted against one another. This is this is a huge concern. And the reason why I bring that up right away is because, as you know, uh, Chris, we live here in Alberta. This, this province has provided so much through its resource sector, through the energy sector, for all of Canada. Other provinces enjoy health care because of this, the hard work of Albertans. And I've never seen... A prime, this prime minister, Justin Trudeau, or his dad, for in that fact, ever stand up for Alberta or the industry. When we saw, you know, Bill C-69 being put in front, Bill C-48, C so the, you know, the no new pipeline bill and, you know, no, the tanker ban bills, and then a carbon tax on top of that, it doesn't show that you're trying to support the industry that's fed so many, not just in Canada, but around the world. Remember, we have the cleanest energy here, and we should be proud of that. Just on those same lines, and, and we see, you know, example after example where, uh, you know, Keystone was was going to be cancelled by by President Joe Biden. We already knew that ahead of time. The Prime Minister should have stood up ahead of time and said, "This is one that we need this." And it's so ironic that President Joe Biden is asking OPEC for more oil, like oil that has no standards on it. 
when we had this pipeline going to America, we would have had better jobs. We would have had our economy would have been better. And this is clean oil that would have went to them. And what safer way to transfer our energy than, than a pipeline? And it helps reduce emissions as well. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna interrupt here for a second because I know there's gonna be someone yelling at their computer screen watching this or yelling at their car stereo watching this and say, and I guarantee you I know who it's probably going to be from the Liberal Party, but they will say, Well, we bought a pipeline. We bought a pipeline, we bought the Trans a Trans Mountain pipeline, and we're gonna get it built and it's gonna take oil from Alberta to uh, the uh, British Columbia coast. What's your what's your response to that? Because every time I've spoken to a liberal candidate or a liberal MP, they've always said, well, we're not against the uh, energy industry in Alberta because we bought a pipeline. So what's your response to that? Well, the proof is in the pudding. So, um, <laughs> and, and where I'll start with that uh, for that question is the project that was on the liberal cabinet table, the Tech Frontier Mine project that was canceled on the liberal cabinet table in 2020. Now it... You know, the, the company had come out and said that, you know, we're, we're not going to move forward with this, but they saw the writing on the wall. How many years did they have to where the goal had moved and over again? Those were 8,000 new jobs that could have been created for Canadians and especially here in Alberta. And on top of that, look at the investment, the, the future of that. It would have created better housing around there, but it was canceled because there's this, there's this uh, you know, in my eyes, there are eco radicals that are sitting sometimes at the at that cabinet table around the Liberals' cabinet desk that wanted to cancel that. That's just that's the proof that's in that pudding. We've seen many projects being canceled even before that. Energy East was canceled. Now, we as Canadians um, take pride in our energy sector, and that's something the Liberal government doesn't. Because did we really need to buy that pipeline? Like that's questionable. Because if we had the right environment here, and we didn't put up these bills that were basically, like I said, the C69 bill, which is a no new pipeline bill, where we can take our product from here in Canada to the West Coast, but no tanker can take it from there abroad. Yet we're pumping in more new oil from outside with no regulations on it. So there has to be proof that you actually care about that industry, which we're not seeing. Now, going back to what, what we were talking about is inflation, is before the pandemic hit and i'll take you back to the um to the home building industry where here in alberta and that's why i was talking about alberta and energy sector so much it wasn't being supported we saw investment fleeing from here trades people that i used to deal with who had crews of 15 to 20 people were having to lay everyone off and go back onto the field themselves because they couldn't afford it there was there was already a, a crash and and we already we felt that so much in alberta I remember when I was door knocking and I was in Marlboro Park and I had this woman come to the door. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget. She was a Lebanese woman and she was in tears. She had a for sale sign on her house and she came to the door with her direct energy bill. She told me just, hey, hang on a second. She went and got her bill and she was crying and saying, how can I afford anything? I'm a single mom. I'm having to sell my house. I cannot afford to live the way that we're living now. I was laid off of my energy sector job where she was enough to for her and her kids. And she pointed at the carbon tax on her bill. And I'll never forget, she said, why am I being penalized? Why, why, what did I do wrong? I'm using just as much as I've been using before. What happened now? And that carbon tax has gone up year over year and it went up again this year. So when we talk about the affordability for Canadians, we, we have to take that very seriously and not keep imposing more tax on them. We just recently heard about a, a possible home tax for Canadians as well. Like this is not the time to be taxing Canadians even further. And right now we know about the debt levels. Inflation is the highest it's ever been in 30 years. This is, this is out of control and it's unacceptable. We've coined the term hashtag just inflation because this is just added debt that keeps on piling on with no sight of bringing it back down. I've, I've said those two examples that came out of the prime minister's mouth, balance, you know, budgets balance, balance themselves. And during this election campaign, in a very, very, um, you know, snark way said, you know, excuse me if I don't think about monetary policy, but excuse us, prime minister, we do think about that. Everyday Canadians think about monetary policy because it directly affects them. 
we're having to, and we're seeing now supply chain shortages caused by many issues, including, and, and this is where the liberal government, again, is failing to make sure our supply chains are, are keeping up. Uh, we're living, you know, two years into this, this uh, COVID crisis. We should have things figured out because Canadians need a surety. They need, they need clarity in their lives. And this all ties back into that same failure that I keep talking about, that the Liberal government is not thinking about everyday Canadians. They're not thinking about the household debt that keeps increasing. And even your example, that same $300 in 2020 could have bought a lot more groceries than it does today. And we see that on our on every single day when we're out, our gas prices, all these things are contributing to that. We need to make sure that we're bringing down that bloat of our debt that, that keeps piling on. And we were talking about this before the pandemic. Our party had numerous times stood up in the House of Commons over and over said, you know, what are we doing about this debt that's out of control? We need to tackle that. And now more than ever, we need that. And we need to make sure that our, our economy is good. Uh, I just have one last question on the topic of inflation, then we'll start the wrap up here. Um, I, I'm a homeowner. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who are across Canada who are homeowners. And when house prices go up, we're happy because that means if we go and sell our house, we're going to get more than we uh, bought it for. If you flood the market with new housings, with affordable housings, then our price, house prices are going to go down. And then, then you're going to hear from the homeowners saying, our house prices are now lower than we bought it for. How do you balance that? How do you balance the the homeowners versus getting people into their homes? Because that's the main thing that I've I wanted to ask any politician, and hopefully you're willing to answer it for us. But I'm a homeowner, and I just want to make sure that my house price continues to go up, but also I don't lose money on my house if I go to sell it in 10, 15, 20 years from now. Absolutely. Look, there's two things to that. Uh, one is the fact that we keep borrowing and printing all this new money. And a lot of it's like this money is also contributing to mortgage rates as well. That's one really big concern that a lot of people are not able to get mortgages. We don't have enough supply in this country. And it's not to say that the supply itself will, um, will totally fix the issue. It will help address the affordability issue for a lot of people. I'll give you an example that my colleague Pierre Polyev and someone who I, I'll, I'll just throw in a, a, a quick shout out to who, who you should, you know, if anyone is watching this, Listen to some of the stuff that he's researching and, and is putting forward that there was an Uber driver that he had met and he was if he was a newcomer here and given the way things are right now, it would take him 20 to 25 years to even save up for a down payment on a brand new house. We do need, you know, and this ties into the immigration that we're bringing more and more people into this country. We need to make sure we have the right infrastructure here as well. And with the supply of houses not being as much as we need them to be, things are skyrocketing people cannot afford to move into a house and canada itself as an infrastructure level is not able to handle all this influx of new people we need to do things hand in hand and make sure that we have a strong thriving economy which includes our energy industry the the part that we need to where where prices will um and sorry let me let me add to that that the concern is land has been inflated where, where, how does, how does that happen? Land is land. It's always been here. Prices of houses go up and down. You know, someone has been from the home, home building industry. Uh, we've seen that too. And at the same time, if you're selling your house for a really high price today, just remember other houses are, are just go, are going up just as much. So you're, you're buying a, for a house that's also been inflated by that much. So it's not just that, that rate. It's the concerning part about new home ownership that people can't see that dream of having new home ownership. That's the main concern that we keep seeing and bringing up in the House of Commons. Inflation having, uh, you know, an effect on land is, is it, it's unthinkable. How does land go up and in, get inflated by that much? Almost by, I believe he was like, you know, something like 20%. Home, uh, average home used to cost about 450,000. Now we're up at about 700 and something thousand dollars. That is very concerning. And again, it's more about, we should be thinking about those, those young people, the young generation, the newcomers here. How do we make sure that they're able to afford their houses? That's what we keep pushing the Liberal government on to make sure that we're tackling this housing crisis that we have right now. Our conservative plan, we did put forward that we would make a million new homes that would help stabilize and not only just house people, but make sure that we're able to control the costs 
and you know foreign home buyers which is which is also a concern that we would help tackle that as well so these are just steps that we had put forward to make sure that we're tackling this house crisis that everyone is seeing now I, I thank you for that um now my last topic oh. of questions here if you want to take a sip of water you can do that but my last topic is 2022, you were the MP for Calgary Forest Lawn. You are the Shadow Minister of Immigration, uh, Citizenship, and Canadian Citizenship and Refugees, sorry. And uh, you have many things on your plate, but you're adding something else as well onto your plate this year, which is launching in February of 2022, so literally next month. And that is a new uh, podcast. What's? Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, thank you so much. So um, the name of the podcast is All That Jazz. And thank you to my grade four teacher for giving me the nickname jazz. So, you know, I just played on that. Um, it's basically another avenue, just like your amazing podcast that you have. It's to reach the, mo the most amount of people that we can. Look, one thing as an MP is to be as accessible as possible. Also, it's always great to have a, a great, um, you know, variety of, of topics and people that you can bring forward. And this does not need to be partisan at all. So I wanted to make sure that we're bringing in community leaders from Calgary Forest Lawn to bring people from different industries to make sure that they're keeping Canadians and people of Calgary Forest Lawn up to date. I want to make sure that we're putting out information that helps those people in Calgary Forest Lawn because we know everyone is still going through a really tough time right now. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they don't like to watch YouTube when they're uh, jogging or, or whenever they're working out, but you know, you're putting in a podcast and you're driving or, or you're exercising is a great is a great way. This is such a great avenue that everyone can have access to this. And that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to make sure that we're we're giving back to our communities. We're making sure that we're giving the most information to help that many more Canadians out. So all that jazz is going to be launching in the next few weeks. February 1st, we're looking to have our first one drop. It's going to be just me in it. But going forward, we have all sorts of people lined up for immigration, for this housing crisis, for industry, for uh, we're going to have youth on there giving their perspectives. Uh, and I might as well just do a plug for my own uh, youth council here. So, you know, I, I run my own youth council. We have people from all sorts of backgrounds. It's a nonpartisan youth council so that we can make sure that we're helping the next generation of youth to step up and be involved now because, you know, that is the future. And they're not just the future, they're the now. And if anyone wants to join that board, you can be from anywhere in Calgary. You can go to, uh, you can email us at justrajsingh.halen at parl.gc.ca. And um, if there's anyone that's watching this, that would like to be on that uh, podcast. And Chris, you know, I'll invite you on there as well. I'd love to hear your perspectives. You know, let's put you in front of the camera on this side. Oh, and uh, hear all about your you, experiences. Uh, you really don't want to hear, if you, if you want to hear an hour's worth of liberal bashing, probably not the person you probably want to get me. Hey, like I said, it's, you know what, I want to, uh, everyone wants to hear about your journey from uh, living in uh, Slave Lake, Alberta to moving to Whitehorn. Everyone wants to hear the perspectives that you have as, as an Albertan, what you're feeling. So, you know, it doesn't need to be partisan at all. We can, we can, Make sure that we're giving value back to everyone. Well, I, I can tell you stories about Aaron O'Toole's first by-election win in 2012 as I covered that for my own <laughs> back in Durham, Ontario. So I can wow. tell you all about Aaron O'Toole as well. There well, you go. I'm look, first I'm reporter to, to interview him on, on his by-election <laughs> run. Um, Jazz, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I, I'm cautious of time here, so I'm going to just do a quick little recap. Um, you are... I. <laughs> I, I, I'm always uh, enthralled about having politicians on the show because you never know how it's going to go, if they're going to give you scripted answers or not. And you seem like a very honest, straightforward guy. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to sit down and do this. Um, how can people reach out? And besides the email, is there any other platforms that you're on that they can reach out and talk to you or get and uh, ask a question about immigration, but also Calgary for response stuff? Absolutely. Uh, again, you can uh, email us and we're, we're very, very uh, accessible. So, uh, and our phone number is 403-207-3030 for anyone that wants to call in. Uh, if I'm here, I, I, I have no issue talking to people on the phone. We can always schedule a meeting through email. I'm on all platforms. I'm on from Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn to Twitter, uh, just Raj S. Hallen. Uh, I'm probably one of the rare people with this name, so you should be able to find me pretty easily. Um, but honestly, just email us if you want a meeting. I, I'm more than happy to, whether you want to come into the office, we can socially distance.
acceptance or just have a phone conversation or Zoom. You know, accessibility is something that um, I always want to make sure that we, we always stick to that, that we're very accessible to people, especially everyone that needs help, which we all know everyone is, is you know, going through something these days. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, thank you for that. For those who have listened to my show and seen it before uh, or watched it before, you know what I'm about to say. The links to all of uh, Jazz's uh, social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, his email address, and also his website and his phone number will be in the show notes below or go back on another page and you can click it out. Um, Jazz, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Well, Chris, honor is all mine. Thank you so much. And again, I just want to urge everyone, if you need help, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Awesome. Uh, for everyone here at the Crossword Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent rest of your day, and we will be back tomorrow morning for another great episode. Talk to you later.